I don't know. I think a lot of people have pens already. If you'd like a pen, um, <coughs> and let me say, you're always free to simply ignore notes. I'm not. I'm not writing down. Meryl Lee wasn't writing down notes. <laughs> you're not making notes on people making notes. I'm not making notes on people making notes. No. You're not so. making notes. And also, don't ever hesitate to get up and go get another cup of coffee or water or more food to eat. Um, I was a seminary professor and I had students eating through classes all the time. So that's part of what happened. You need to explain you taught in three hours. I taught in three hour blocks, three hour and 15 minutes and so. Yes. That was cruel. <laughs> You'd be surprised, though. <laughs> yeah, it, it got the whole the whole course done in one day. So ah. They would only have to come for one day. Well, that's not so one hard. night a, or, one or night. a day in a, a week yeah. for a semester. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But but it forces you as a teacher to be creative because you can't keep their attention no, unless you're every 
a half hour or so, you switch gears yeah. and do something a little bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, <coughs> let's open in prayer, okay? Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for um, the Lord's Prayer, a prayer that we're thinking about and learning from. We pray that tonight as we understand better some of the, the phrases in it, that we will find it useful in our own prayer. We pray this in <clears throat> Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we pray the Lord's Prayer almost every Sunday, right? Um, and it's a prayer that has wound up just being so important in the liturgy and the faith of the Christian church through the ages. But one of the problems with what are called set prayers, and a set prayer is a prayer that is written out and maybe memorized, versus extemporaneous <clears throat> prayers, which are prayers that are... Um, just our conversation or speaking to God is that those set prayers can become rote. We have memorized them. We know them. We have recited them so many times that we stop thinking about them. And so part of what I'm hoping to do with this series is help us to think a little more um, wisely and knowledgeably about what's going on. <clears throat> but as I'll say as we get to the end, what we don't want to do is simply um, know about the Lord's Prayer. We want it to lead us to shaping our praying. So we will get to that as we go on. A little bit of review. Um, we, well, before we do a little bit of review, um, each week I said that we would... Um, uh, listen to a piece of music of the Lord's Prayer. And so the, um, the selection I have for this week is a boys' choir in a cathedral in Britain. And they're really quite good. Where's the cathedral? I'm sorry, I forget. I can look it up.
Welsh, but I couldn't find the, the cathedral where uh, this was done. Um, okay, so um, a little bit of a review, just going back, and we'll do this very quickly. We talked about what prayer is, the first week, and I suggested um, just a nice, easy definition of prayer it comes from Clement of Rome of Alexandria. Alexandria, Egypt, written probably around 190, early 200s, and he said, prayer is conversation with God. We talked about the structure of the Lord's Prayer, that it begins with an invocation, our Father who art in heaven, and then it goes on with three clauses about God's glory, requesting God's glory, hallowed be your name, we're praying that God's name would be hallowed. Your kingdom come, we pray. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And those are about raising up God and glorifying him. And then three clauses about our needs. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us and lead us not into temptation. Protect us from the evil one. And then finally, the doxology. Um, the first week, we spent some time looking at the first phrase, the invocation, our Father who art in heaven. And we talked about the importance of seeing this with both dimensions of our understanding of God here. The intimacy that we have as we talk about God as Father, and the awe that is due God because he is the great and holy God of all creation, creator of heaven and earth, and separate and distinct from anything that is related to the creation itself, and thus our God, our Father, who is in heaven. Last week, we spent some time looking at this phrase, hallowed be thy name. <clears throat> and we spent some time looking at what the word hallowed means. It means sanctified or set apart, or pure. God, may your name be raised up and separate and realize that this is, that your name is distinct and separate. May we respect your name. And then your name in the Bible is often used in reference to the totality of someone's being. When we say, Hallowed be your name. We're not just saying, you know, using the Lord's name in vain. We're talking about our total respect and lifting up God as he is, God in his whole being. We also, last week, spent a little bit of time just looking at some of the presuppositions of prayer. That God, if we're going to pray, we are assuming that God does in fact exist. That God is personal, you know, and by that I mean not just merely a force in the universe like gravity. We can't pray to gravity or the force be with you in Star Wars as if the force can somehow respond. God is personal, and so we understand that. We also, as a personal God, believe that God hears Otherwise, we wouldn't waste our time talking with him and hearing that he also cares. That he's not like, well, who cares? Um, that God is good. He wants the best for us. He desires a relationship with us and that he can do things with us. God doesn't, as we pray, go, well, that's a problem, isn't it? <laughs> you know, we assume that as we ask a God and pray to God, that God is a God who can do things. So with that, let's move on to the phrases we're going to look at today. And today only, we're going to look at two together because these two stand together. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, as we look at this, what's your first thought when you hear these words? Kingdom and kings. What comes to mind instantly? Yes. Henry VIII. 
<laughs> Henry VIII, okay? <coughs> what else? Yeah. Royalty. Yeah. Pardon? Power. Power. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, Camelot. Camelot. Yes, and all the stories of Camelot. Anything else? <coughs> it's a nation. It's a, it's a huge nation. Of... Okay, a nation. Okay. Yes. I heard another voice. There's a new one in Britain. A new king in Britain, yes. And so as we think about these terms, you know, the idea of royalty comes to mind. We start thinking about that. But I think it's worth our spending a little time tonight thinking about what would have been going on in the disciples' mind as Jesus talked about this. So what were they thinking? They weren't imagining Henry VIII. <laughs> they weren't imagining Camelot. Um, what was in the minds of the disciples as they heard Jesus say that they should pray, your kingdom come? Well, let's begin by looking at the, the Kadesh prayer, which is a part of the Jewish liturgy, the daily prayers within Judaism. And I'm using this because um, these prayers go back to the time of Jesus. It may not have been worded exactly like this, but these ideas would have been familiar to any Jewish person in the first century. They would have been praying very, very similar prayers. And so the Kadesh prayer begins, glorified and sanctified be God's great name. Hey, and by the way, does that sound like anything? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hallowed be thy name. Remember we said hallowed means sanctified. Okay. So again, this, this prayer, stands as a foundation to what Jesus is doing. Glorified and sanctified be God's great name throughout the world which he has created according to his will. May he establish his kingdom. What are we looking at today? Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Again, this idea that God has a kingdom that is to come. May he establish his kingdom in your lifetime and during your days and within the life of the entire house of Israel speedily and soon and say <laughs> amen. <laughs> we want this. <clears throat> and then it continues. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then it continues. May his great name be blessed forever and to all eternity. And goes on uh, longer than that. My point is that as the disciples listened to Jesus' prayer, he wasn't offering something that would have been, on the face of it, shocking. They have been praying for these sorts of things in the past. Jesus sharpens things, but he also broadens it, allowing them to expand it out and bring more into it. And so that is a part of what would have been what the disciples were thinking about. But another part of it is the whole, the whole history and narrative of the Old Testament. They knew that this idea of a kingdom and God's kingdom just kind of ran like a thread through the whole Old Testament. And by the way, um, you guys are getting kind of an advance um, prequel to a lot of what we're going to be preaching about through January to, I'd say, about, say, May this coming year, where we're going to be looking at the, God's story in the Bible as a whole. And in the first, those first five months or so, we're going to be just working our way through the Old Testament. But one of the themes we're going to be spending a lot of time with is the idea of God as king in the Old Testament. So again, a little bit of background. So what are the, what are the disciples remembering 
as they remember the Old Testament stories. They're remembering that God made a covenant with Abraham. You are my chosen person, God says to Abraham, and I'm going to bless you, and he names some of the blessings, and he ends up by saying that you're going to, I'm going to make you extremely fruitful, your <coughs> descendants will become many nations, and then the second giving of that covenant to Abraham, it ends with these words, and kings will be among your descendants. There will be kings that come out of your line. You have been blessed to be a blessing, and there are going to be kings. And so they would think back to that idea of God's covenant. They would remember that there were bad kings in Israel's history, starting with Pharaoh, who refused to let the people leave Egypt. They finally get out, and they eventually have their own kingdom, set up their kingdom in Israel, and there were, you know, you just go through the stories of the Old Testament, and there are a pile of rotten kings, and they remember bad kings, but they also remember that God revealed himself to be a king. And so even back in the book of Exodus, we read, the Lord will reign forever and ever. Reign, that idea of being a king, of ruling over the people. And as the story goes on through the Old Testament, we come to the people of Israel coming to Samuel and saying, we're tired of the way things are running now. We want a king like the nations around us. And Samuel is shocked and dismayed, and he goes to God and says, what do I do about their stupid request? <laughs> and God says, they're not rejecting you, Samuel. They're rejecting me. They're rejecting me because I am their king. Go ahead and give them a king, but warn them what they're going to be like. And Samuel warns them that they're going to have bad kings. But God is king. Of course, there are some good kings too. And we read about David and the covenant that God makes with David that he will have a royal lineage that will go on forever. There will always be someone on his throne. And as we move into the prophets, we begin to get this glimpse of a kingdom that is to come, that God is going to work and replace these shabby imitations of what a king should be that they had, and they are going to have a true and royal king who represents all that God wants for them, a king <coughs> who is in fact <coughs> divine. And so we have these promises emerging in the prophets and eventually, of course, we come to Jesus. And Jesus keeps talking about a kingdom in his teaching. It was central to his message. When Mark summarizes what Jesus taught, and this is right in the very first chapter as Mark is starting to lay out what Jesus was about, he says, later on after John was arrested, Jesus went into Galilee where he preached God's good news. <coughs> the time promised by God has come at last, he announced. The time promised by God, what was the promise? Of a king, of a kingdom. The time promised by God has come at last, he announced. The kingdom of God <coughs> is near. Repent of your sins and believe the good news. And as Jesus enters into his ministry, as we read through the Gospels, this idea of the <coughs> kingdom of God is just central to what he's talking about. He says the kingdom of God is near. But he also goes on and says, not only is it near, it is here where certain things are happening. It's near to everyone, but where people are responsive to God's reign, 
the kingdom is not just near, it's here. It is with them. And the kingdom is something to be sought after. And so we have those parables of the kingdom where Jesus says, you know, it's like a treasure in a field. And we all know what we would do if we heard that there was a fantastic treasure in this field. And the field was for sale. <laughs> and <clears throat> it's only $5,000. We'd round up 5000 bucks. <clears throat> would, if necessary, recruit some friends. You want in on this? And would buy the field because that treasure is worth infinitely more than anything we could invest or the pearl of great price he said this kingdom is something that we desire it's out there it's available but you can acquire it it can become a part of who you are and it can be you can be in god's kingdom but so what we have is the kingdom is near. The kingdom is here for those who participate in it. But also, he says, the kingdom will come. The kingdom is coming. And so we have passages like this. And I tell you this, that many Gentiles will come from all over the world, from east and west, and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob at the feast mm -hmm. in the kingdom of heaven. This is a future time. And of course, he's telling us to pray for the kingdom in the Lord's <coughs> Prayer. So, Jesus is talking about the kingdom. And as scholars have tried to make sense of what this all means, it's pretty clear, I think, that the kingdom is not a place. It's not a place where we can go. If we just changed churches, <laughs> we could get to the kingdom. If we just changed denominations, we would finally be in God's kingdom. If we moved from this country to another country, we could get to the kingdom of God. No, it's not a place. Rather, in Jesus' teaching, the kingdom of God is something incredibly dynamic. It's where anywhere where God is king, where God reigns. If God is reigning in your life, my life, these lives, then the kingdom of God is right here. It's not about 420 North Broadway. It's not about Aberdeen. It's not about any of the... It's where God is reigning, where God is king. And so Jesus, as we make sense of all of this, what he's saying is the kingdom of God has been inaugurated, if you will. It's been started. The kingdom of God has come, but it's not here in all of the fullness that it will someday be. So we pray, thy kingdom come, not saying that it's not already here in our hearts and among us, but we are praying for it to be all that it is intended to be, where God's reign will be all-consuming. So, Jesus also says that the kingdom of God needs to be responded to. And we respond in faith and placing our faith in what God is doing. We understand it will be costly. It requires repentance. But the bottom line, God is king. God rules. That's it. Jesus is <clears throat> Lord. And so as we think about what the disciples are listening to and what they're understanding thinking back to the Old Testament as they listen to Jesus in all of his teaching they get these three ideas and you could get more Jesus is Lord and that becomes the first great confession in the early church Jesus is Lord Jesus is King he is the King of my life the Lord reigns. God 
brains <coughs> in what's going on. And so those ideas stand behind this first phrase. Your kingdom, <coughs> God, we're praying that you will reign. You will reign not only in our lives, but in the whole world. And that leads us then to the second phrase. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And again, it's worth asking, what were the disciples thinking? What's going on in their minds as they hear this? And of course, they're thinking about all of this stuff we've talked about. The idea that God is king. They have, they're familiar with that idea. They've been listening to Jesus. And in an ancient world that wasn't a constitutional monarchy like Britain today, if, if you had a king, there's a really significant understanding of authority and submission. Absolute rule. God reigns. Another aspect of this, though, and here's why I'm keeping these two phrases together, thy will be done, uh, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, is about Hebrew parallelism. And we talked about this this summer. Almost certainly, these two phrases are speaking to the same sort of thing. If God's kingdom has come, then... There will be rule on earth the way there is in heaven. Which raises an interesting question. How do you imagine heaven? Well, not a place where there are civil wars and rebellions, right? <laughs> this is a place of peace where God rules, where everyone understands who God is. And so, thy kingdom come. <coughs> Let it come where God is completely in control. And when that happens, then things here on earth will be the way they are in heaven. Perfect and peaceful and submitted, submissive to God. So, what does this mean? What is it that God wants? I think it's also worth spending a little bit of time thinking about this. If you were trying to summarize what God wants, without looking at the notes, <laughs> what, what does God want? Relationship? He wants a relationship, yes. He wants a relationship with us. Yeah. <coughs> so we can talk about salvation and reconciliation and fellowship and a whole conglomerate of ideas around this idea of relationship. We can go back to the story of creation and the idea that the imagery in the creation story of Adam and Eve walking with God, spending time with God, that idea of a relationship. Yeah, so that's one thing. What else does God want? <coughs> Devotion. Devotion. Expand on that, Scott. When you, when you say devotion, what are you thinking? Because this could go a couple of ways. And you may have both of them that I want to draw <coughs> out. So <laughs> I'll let you do it. Hmm. You I, do the work. I, guess, I don't know. I guess I mean, um, he wants to be praised. He wants, to, he wants to be the most important thing. Okay. So the idea of glory and praise. Yeah. Yeah. Devotion, commitment. I mean, there's so many ways that we could play that out. We're committed to God. We are devoted to God. We want to spend time with God. We want that relationship rule, the El real that Eleanor mentioned. Yeah. But then praise and worship and glory, too. What else does God want? Yeah. He wants us to know that he loves us. He wants us to know that he loves us. Yeah. He wants us to understand who he is and how he relates to us. He wants us to be his instruments. He wants us to be his instruments. Yes, he wants us to be living 
in a way that is in accord with who he is and fulfilling his mission. Yeah. So we have, again, a whole conglomerate of ideas that we could unpack here. Everything from the idea of obedience and submission, because after all, he's king. Um, but then holiness. God is holy, so we should be holy. Um, remember, holy is never perfect. I mean, we're, we will never be completely holy, but we are to seek to be like God, to be like him. No naughtiness at all. Set apart. Good and special. Yeah. Okay. What else might God want? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Yeah. We're summarizing just a whack load of ideas through the, through the Bible here. But one that we may overlook sometimes is in Ephesians chapter 3. This amazing text. Um, and all of what you've said is absolutely true. But in Ephesians chapter, I think I said three, but I meant one. In Ephesians one, we have this incredible doxology to God in verses three through 14. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as I read this, listen to the words that reference God's will, his plans, his purposes, that sort of thing, because we'll see him talking, Paul, talking about what God's will is. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless, to be, that's purpose, to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given to us and the one he loves. So that speaks to Eleanor, that idea of a relationship, right? You know, he, he wants us to come into this relationship with him. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ. Now, he's revealed to us the mystery of his will, and now he's going to start saying, so what is that giant encompassing will he goes on to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ in him we were also chosen having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will in order that we who were the first to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. So do you catch all the different themes in here? There's salvation, there's relationship, there's holiness, there's all of this, but there's also this idea that at the end of time, that he wants to bring everything into submission under the will of God. In other words, into the kingdom where God reigns. So what is it that God wants what is his will as we pray, thy kingdom come, <coughs> thy will be done. His will is for salvation and reconciliation. It's for obedience and submission and holiness. It's for praise and glory of God that we are giving to him. But it's also this idea of everything coming together under one great and almighty king. So, thy kingdom come, God reigns, thy will be done, what God wants gets accomplished. How? In what way? In some limited way? No. As it is in heaven. And so, what is heaven like? 
I would love to take the time, but we're not going to. But if we were to turn to Revelation 4 and 5, we have this incredible vision of heaven. And in it we hear about God on a throne, high and lifted up, and beauty, and, you know, this sea of glass laid out before God. And we have elders and angels worshiping God, singing holy, 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 and there's peace and tranquility and submission in the <laughs> ultimate sense. God is reigning. Okay? And again, that imagery for us, they didn't have that yet. They didn't have Revelation 4 and 5, but as we pray this, we can bring that imagery to mind as well. So what's going on in heaven? Submission and worship. No sign of rebellion. God reigns. So, all of that has been thinking about what these words mean. But what I'd like to do now is start transitioning to, so what? Okay? Um, what does this have to say to us? And as we think about these two phrases, um, there are a couple of implications that I, or four implications I want to draw out. The first one is, what would it mean, and here, this is a discussion, okay, and, you know, just for us to think about together. What would it mean for Jesus to truly be Lord and King today? We pray this. Thy kingdom come. And we should then ask, well, what would that look like here in Aberdeen, here in this church? And maybe even more threateningly, <laughs> here in me, right? Judy? No more homeless people. Okay. Everyone would have a place to go. It would affect the social realities of life in a really big way, wouldn't it? Yeah. Any other thoughts? What would it mean for Jesus to truly be king? Yeah. No more war. No more war. Yeah, and we think about Ukraine and <laughs> Russia. Again, I know I always bring this in in these discussions, Ethiopia. I was born in Ethiopia, and I'm always shocked at how Western European wars show up in the news, and wars in Africa are so often lost in the news, but Ethiopia is going through an appalling war. I read um, something. Somalia that, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Somalia That like. said that uh, in World War II, Italy colonized Ethiopia, Eritrea, yeah. Sudan. Yeah. I didn't, I don't the remember. The station that my that. parents worked at where I went to as a little boy was bombed by the Italians. We were on the Sudanese side of the border and they assumed the bomber didn't have GPS. <laughs> didn't know they were bombing Sudan, but they bombed the missionary station room a couple of years before my parents went out there and a number of the missionaries were killed. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. What else? Thinking about Jesus as king. Servant. What do you mean? King servant. Okay, yeah. King is not to be worshipped, but to serve. Okay, serving the king, yeah. Yeah. Not yeah. Short-tempered. Pardon? Not being short-tempered. <laughs> oh, you're getting it, it, it's just going to affect character, I think I'm hearing you say, Scott. Yeah. Right? Yeah. If Jesus has said, this is how you live, we're going to go, okay, I better live like he says. Yeah. Yeah. I, I keep thinking, you know, if, if Jesus is Lord and Grace Harbor and whatever, what about all these denominations that don't even agree? <laughs> How do we go after that? Well, <laughs> I, yes, I think that 
if Jesus was Lord, there would be, we, we would have a more unified understanding. We might still be in separate congregations so that we can do different things, but we would be a whole bunch more loving. We would be more united in understanding. Maybe our aesthetics would be, would be different. The Presbyterians would still be using the Lord's Prayer in the service, and the Baptists would not be. Um, I grew up a Baptist, and, you know, I had a conversation with my sister a, a number of years ago, and I said, Judy, when did we learn the Lord's Prayer? And in our family, family devotions was something, you know, it was like, half an hour, 45 minutes after supper every night. I mean, this was Christian education time par excellence. And, <laughs> and you know, I, we, learned, we learned so many Bible verses, memorizing so many things, but I can't remember ever learning the Lord's Prayer. So I, I think there's aesthetics, and, you know, that's fine. But there would be a whole bunch more love and unity <coughs> among the denominations. Let's go on. We could spend a long time, but l let me say, we're going to talk about praying this in a little bit. We need to be asking this question. What would it mean when I pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven? We should be asking, so what does that mean? What am I praying for, really? deeper, okay? Next question. As we observe a pretty seriously dysfunctional world, any question about that? <laughs> okay, we're, we're all on board. We, li we live in a pretty dis seriously dysfunctional world. Yeah. How do we process the absence of God's kingdom? The fall. Okay, the fall. We believe in a <coughs> fallen world. And so part of this idea as we think about this prayer and as we pray that relates to our understanding of the world as it is, about the relationship with God and the need for God. Yeah. Also free will. Also free will, and, yes. And people can choose to accept or reject God's lordship, his right. kingship, but also Christians can, in certain areas of their lives, choose to ignore God's kingship. Yeah, I've done that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We, we can, we look at our lives and we can say, I'm not letting God be Lord here. I'm setting this part of my life apart. And, and not in that holy way, right? <laughs> okay. Another question. How does this idea affect the way we think about our mission? Personally. And as a church. Do we know what our church is about? Do we think about it as having a mission statement? Put at the top of our agenda for session, every session meeting, our church's mission statement as given on the church website. Um, three, three elders here. Yeah. You guys know, right? And we read that every week. This is what this church is about. But, you know, we, we can see this kind of thing out there, can't we? And so... I saw this out of McDonald's in Northbrook. McDonald's brand mission is to, quote, be our customer's favorite place and way to eat. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Their worldwide operations have been aligned around a global strategy called the plan to win, centering on the five basics of an exceptional customer experience. People, products, place, price, and promotion. They are committed <laughs> to improving their operations and enhancing their customers' experience. This is not, I'm not making this up. This was on a McDonald's in Northbrook. 
Wow. So, so let, let, me, let me just say, <laughs> you know, you see something like this, and you're going, are they living up to that? Is this my favorite place to, and way to eat? I may eat there once in a while, but truly. There's some restaurants that I think are better. <laughs> um, and so we can see mission statements and we can go, well, they're not living up to that, right? Yeah, total fail. <laughs> and so the question, how does this idea affect the way we think about our mission? Do you have a mission, personally? Do you think about your life and say, I know what God has called me to be, to do? Do we, as a church, think about everything we are doing in the light of our mission, of what God, what we feel God has called this, church to be, not, not the church in Northbrook that I came from, not the other churches in the harbor area. What is, what is our mission? And how are we living this out? Are we living? And when we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. What is God's will for me, for First Presbyterian Church of Aberdeen? Right. Another question. Just one more. Do we pray? <laughs> and this is the bottom line. Do we pray it? Or do we just say it? Right? You know what I mean? And that comes back where I started. For Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors unless we're transgressors. Um, we just rattle it through and we're not praying. We're not asking that God's kingdom will come. We're not praying that God's will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So, one final thing. What the disciples said to Jesus, and we talked about this first week, is not... What they said was, teach us to pray. Not, teach us about your prayer. <laughs> right? In other words, and I haven't emphasized this so far, but I want us to be heading in this direction, to be thinking about how does this shape the way we pray as God's people? And so some suggestions. Um, when we begin our prayer, our Father who art in heaven, do we revel in the intimacy of that, of what that's saying? In other words, do we just go, God, you are truly my Father. And now, you know, I'm, you're going to hear me just kind of thinking about how we could pray. Father, Thank you that you are my father. I've had, I have so many people in my life who just don't function well. You are my father. I loved my dad. God, you know that. But you are truly the best father that I could have. Do we revel in the fatherhood of God, that relation, that intimacy? Do we go on to that awe? God, I'm so amazed at the fact that you love me, that you care for me, you listen to me. You are the eternal God. You are the righteous God. And we could use all of the things we know about God, the attributes of God. God, you are the creator of this world and Today, on this beautiful, gorgeous day in the middle of October, thank you for your creation. 
everlasting God. You are everlasting. We bring in our understanding of God, and when we say, our Father who art in heaven, we have, we're talking about who God is. Hallowed be thy name, we go on. And we confess. That phrase is an opportunity for confession. Lord, I don't hallow your name. I haven't been setting it apart. I've just been going through the motions recently. I know that I've not been treating my wife with what the care that I should or whatever. Um, Hallow be thy name offers time to confess. Your name, Lord, it is so good. You are so good. And we pray that it will be, that God's name will be hallowed and set apart in all of our lives. Thy kingdom come. Again, when we pray that phrase, it's opening up an opportunity for confession. Lord, you know that in this area of my life, I'm not letting you be king. I am holding you at a distance. Lord, forgive me. And let me be guided by your Holy Spirit. Do you hear what I'm saying? Thy kingdom come. You, Lord, I want you to be king. But then it's also an occasion for us to pray for the church around the world. Lord, in our church here in Aberdeen, help us to be agents of your kingdom. As we think about the church in Ukraine and South America, these places, Lord, you be king there too. And we pray for them. And then we pray, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Once again, and I'm highlighting this because, you know, this, this prayer is an outline for prayer. And it leaves room for us to adapt it and, and phrase it around where we need to be. Thy will be done, Lord. I know I should have. And so once again, confession. Ask God to help you in your needs. Praise God for showing us his will. God, thank you that we as a church are going in a good direction. You know, help us to continue to be seeking your will in all the decisions and actions that we do. Look with confidence and thanks to the assurance that God wins. And so... A couple of people, you've heard me, and I've used this as the call to worship, or the a prayer, the prayers of the people a couple of times. This is an expanded Lord's Prayer. I had a few of you ask me for it, and I said that it would come. But each, each phrase is expanded with some ideas associated with it how that might go in our personal prayers. Um, <clears throat> our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Help us, Lord, to really know you, to bless and worship you and praise you for all your works and for all that shines forth from them. Your almighty power, wisdom, kindness, justice, mercy, <clears throat> and truth. Help us direct all our living, what we think, say, and do, so that your name will never be blasphemed because of us, but always honored glorified and praised. Okay. That's kind of spelling out some of the implications. Your kingdom come. Rule us by your spirit and spirit in such a way that more and more we submit to you. Keep your church strong and add to it. Destroy the forces of evil that revolt against you and your will until your kingdom is complete and perfect. That in it you are all in all. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Help us and all people to reject our own wills and to obey your will without our too common tendency to talk back. <clears throat> yeah. Your will alone is good. Help us, one and all, to carry out the work we are called to as willingly and faithfully as the angels in heaven. Now let me say, this prayer isn't something that you should take and now necessarily start 
praying at. <laughs> what I'd love for you to do this week <clears throat> is to use the ideas here and some of the things we've talked about to pray the Lord's Prayer, to spend some time going through it, our Father who art in heaven, and then talk to God about what that means to <coughs> you. Hallowed be your name. And talk to God about how that speaks to you and what that means and what that calls for you or from you. Your kingdom come. Expand it out. What God is calling you. Do you understand what I'm saying? So this week, we're going to, I'm going to throw that out as the challenge. Next week, we'll start by saying, so, how'd that work? Okay? But next week, we're also going to spend some time praying together. Okay? And what we want to do, I don't know how, I know Presbyterians are much more reserved about praying in front of other people than Baptists are. But, you know, some of you at least, I'd love for all of us. And they'll just be sentence prayers you, and you, no compulsion. Don't stay away because you don't feel comfortable to pray. But what we want to do is spend some time starting to pray together, saying, and what we'll do, what I'll do is I'll say, Our Father who art in heaven, and I'm going to stop, and I'm going to let you throw out a sentence. Or two sentences, and then another person, and then another person. And when it stops, we'll go on to another phrase. Okay, we're going to pray together. We're going to use the Lord's Prayer as what I think it is, a model for prayer. Sound like a plan? Mm -hmm. We'll see you next week. Well, folks, it's so fun to be the pastor here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>